Well, I would like to, to welcome you all. So as I was saying, uh, we're going to, to start with this session on MPE Diaglose. Uh, and I, and I was, uh, as I was explaining here, there has been a lot of changes, great things happening in the space of, of, of myeloma. And, um, but as you know, there are still a lot of challenges out there. We, have, uh, we haven't focused yet on, on access issues across different uh, countries in order to access to, to, to treatment. Also, there are issues related with, with uh, some studies that are, are still showing that between 10 and 20% of the patients who are diagnosed uh, with dialoma dies within 60 days from the diagnosis. We, um, basically, this is due to uh, th there is a still a uh, certain lack of, of knowledge and awareness between the, the, the general practitioners community and some other uh, issues in accessing to diagnosis in, in the myeloma. And, and well, to, to discuss all, all of all these opportunities that we have now in, in order to win the battle against myeloma, and also about the challenges that we are facing, we, we have here five, five, uh, five people who are accompanying us, and I'm going to introduce you to, to, to yourselves. So here uh, on my left, we have Dr. Alberto Oriol from uh, the Maturity Department of the Institute Catalan de Oncologia in, in Barcelona. Um, <laughs> welcome. Um, also, a very familiar face to you, which is uh, Sofia Sacardoso, former director of the uh, Portuguese Association Against uh, Leukemia, and currently a very, a very active uh, patient advocate at the European level. I said former because, <laughs> yeah, right now she's, uh, she's, she's, she's basically uh, doing uh, advocacy at the European level. Also, a very familiar face to you, for many of you, which is uh, Susana Leto. <laughs> is the former head of patient advocacy in uh, Novartis Oncology Europe, which is going to represent uh, the, the industry point of view. Then Beatriz uh, Flores, which is uh, um, the expert medical assessor for the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency in the UK, and also involved, of course, in the European Medicines Agency, which is going to give us the, the view of the, of the, from the regulatory side. And finally, Dr. Jaime, uh, Jaime Spin, PhD professor in the Andalusian School of Public Health, also a collaborator uh, with the European Commission in some studies about pricing and, and, and reimbursement, and also a collaborator of the World Health Organization in the Global Pricing uh, Initiative, which is going to give us a little bit more about the payer perspective. Um, so before starting and opening the discussion to you, I would like to make an introductory question to, to each of you. Um, and then, please feel free to participate, to discuss and debate, and, 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 and give us your, your view. So I would like to start uh, with you, uh, Dr. Oriol. So as we were discussing here, it has been great with us happening in myeloma over the last years. Uh, you, you have been witnessing new drugs coming, better understanding of the, of the biology of, of, of uh, uh, myeloma and so on. And right now, from your perspective as a clinician, and also involved in some clinical trials as a, as a primary investigator, what is your view about how, how are we now in myeloma, and, and what are the challenges for the future? And also, I would like to, to know your opinion about this topic, which seems to be arising. Are we right now heading a cure to myeloma? Are we still trying to chronify the disease? What is your, your view about this? Well, uh, from my point of view, we've been living a couple of important changes in the treatment of myeloma. The first one is, of course, uh, we have new drugs, but maybe the, the big change now is another one, which is how to, who, how to better use these drugs. In a sense, we have had thalidomide, thalinolidomide, bortezomib, carstilzomib coming on, and we have introduced them given the concept that myeloma was not curable. So we've been sequencing the drugs, we've been using one after the other one just to treat relapse because we, we assumed that relapse was inevitable. So we always try to keep uh, drugs for a later stage. We always try to take the maximum each drug before mm -hmm. changing to another one. And that's been more or less what's been happening in the last 10 years with all the new drugs and all the new chances to treat relapse mainly. The big change now is that we are coming to realize that we can use that, these drugs better, combining them all together from the beginning. And that means that instead of having a, an improvement of survival that we've had, uh, consisting of uh, doing several 
treatments for several relapses and, and go on, which is not special, it's not particularly good for the quality of life in the end, because when you've yeah. relapsed several, several times, the quality of life starts to deteriorate very rapidly. Uh, maybe if we just used all the good drugs at the same time, we, we could probably cure some patients. That's, that's clearly possible, but even if we are, we are not curing, instead of having several responses to treatment, we can have a long one, which in terms of uh, quality of life is much better. This poses several challenges, of course. That means that we have, from the point of view of the patients, we have to see if that, re it, that represents really an improvement in, quali in quality of life, because all these drugs may be toxic, may be toxic in the long run. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to tell a patient that's been well for 10 years to continue with treatment, because we are not only doing more intensive treatments, but we are doing more prolonged treatments. So that's, that's an important challenge. It's a challenge for us also, because that means that we have to do clinical trials to prove that this is a real improvement and these trials uh, are lasting several years because we don't, you don't see the benefit in only two or three years. And it poses a challenges also to the systems because it means that we are using lots of drugs for a long time which are very expensive. So uh, it's not a problem only for, uh, I'd say, Pakistan or, <laughs> or Angola. It's a problem for Germany or United States or Japan. How to, how to just uh, reimburse these drugs. You know? so that's, that's more or less <laughs> a <laughs> summary. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Oriol. So uh, now I would like to ask Sofia, because you have been involved for about a decade now in, in advocacy. You have, been, you have had the opportunity to work both at national but also at the European meeting. Uh, many patients and having a lot of experiences. And as you all know, myeloma is a disease which not only impacts on, on the, let's say, the physical side, but also has another impact on patients from what is called the psychosocial sphere. So uh, from your perspective, right now that we're having patients that are living longer, but at the same time uh, are starting to have more needs, what are the main, the main points or the main things that you think are, uh, are impacting more the well-being and the quality of life of, of of patients, of patients and caregivers? Yeah, that's an excellent question, Alfonso. I thought you were going to ask me about access uh, <laughs> because that's always the, the main challenge. That's great we, that you we'll asked me. We'll go to challenge, so yeah, we always still have a lot of yeah, time. That's, that's very good. Well, I would uh, uh, divide between the younger patients and the older patients. Uh, although uh, in terms of uh, uh, follow-up, um, the follow-up phase, uh, the cares are, are the same. There are different impacts in what concerns the, the younger patients. Uh, and I'm talking not only about the patients, but also the, the caregivers. Um, and I want to point out, now that you're talking about this, uh, about the younger patients, uh, an issue uh, that really concerns me, concerns me a lot which is the reintegration in the, in the marketplace. It, uh, because uh, after uh, being uh, cured, or, uh, after being able to uh, uh, return to work, um, they need to, uh, to go to work, but uh, slowly. And uh, in many countries, uh, including Portugal, there is not a special legisl legislation or, or protection for, for these patients that allow them to return to work. So what uh, happens is that uh, uh, this patient, which is capable and uh, it's uh, an economical value for, for, for the country, um, can't uh, re-enter the marketplace gradually and it will happen that we will have to uh, return home after a month or two or uh, sometimes it has uh, uh, an employer which is uh, understandable and kind enough to uh, com uh, understand the situation and let, uh, and let him manage that. Uh, but most of the times he'll just lose his job. Mm -hmm. And this is so stupid because there are other, other diseases, chronic diseases like, uh, in fact, like uh, diabetes or others that uh, uh, allowed people to uh, have uh, uh, to work to to have home working mm -hmm. for uh, twice a week, but uh, like cancer is not considered a chronic uh, disease, 
they do not have such kinds of, um, of benefits. So this is a, a challenge uh, that I think uh, we should all advocates be very, uh, should be concerned about how to uh, deal with, uh, with this legisl legislation in, in different countries and try to uh, reintegrate uh, these, these patients when they are active in the, in the market, in the marketplace. Um, so that they can uh, regain uh, as many uh, control uh, of their of as many aspects as, as they can in their lives, and we can we became independent uh, as much as they as they and, product, and productive as much as possible. Um, this is uh, the main issue that uh, that uh, I really want to 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 say here, and uh, uh, of course, uh, the other challenge is the, um, the surveillance of, uh, of uh, post-treatment phase, and that affects, of course, not only the, the patient, but also the, the caregiver, and, uh, and the, the stress, which is to live in the, the uh, survival phase, let's say like this, and uh, the surveillance phase, and uh, the, the caregiver really needs to be um, to, to know that a patient is caring and is taking notes and has his diary and it goes to the checkup controls and uh, uh, does the best for his health because it is such a psychological burden. Um, of course, uh, there, 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 are, there are lots of things that we can do to support them, but uh, I think there's more that we advocates can do about that. Thank you, thank you very much for your, for your answer. And I would like to go with, with Beatriz, uh, uh, especially I would like to know your opinion. As working for, for a regulatory body, uh, when we were discussing during the briefing, we were talking that, as I said, myeloma is a winner. I think what has happened with myeloma is something with uh, no many precedents in, in, the, in oncology and probably in, in, in other uh, disease areas, like having five new agents approved in the the space of two three years by the by the EMA, and so on. And when I was solving the the myeloma pipeline, it really seems that this is going to 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 be even bigger in the in the coming year. We have been around 20 or 25 new molecules with phase two three trials. So I would like to know your your opinion in in how does the regulator uh, deals really with this a storm, let's say, of new drugs uh, during the approval process. And also, if, um, if, if uh, something, something that has been discussed in the community is how having drugs that are adding more value and how the regulator can incorporate certain surrogate endpoints like my, minimal residual disease, which is kind of, kind of important. Also, patient preferences that are included during the drug development process beyond the hard and poison such as overall survival or uh, progression free survival. So I think you wanted to have some backup slides, so if you, yes. if you want to go to the podium, that's, that's okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me today. I'm a regulator, but my background, I'm a hematologist. So I worked in the UK, in the hospital, uh, in the hematology department and then for over 10 years, and then I moved to the regulatory side. So I'm in the UK agency, in the MHRA, and for over 10 years now, and uh, I'm also a member of the Oncology Working Party. So I work also at European level. So this slide is that from the regulatory side, uh, the increasing trend we have in myeloma, which is unique. I mean, it all started in 2004, we had Velcade, and it was the first new drug that made a difference. Up to then, we were with the Melphaland, the Prednisolone, and so on. But it didn't stop there. It just, it followed with the Revlimid and Thalidomide. Thalidomide, the drug with a bad history, it, it, it became a drug that was necessary and it was useful, and, and so on. But it's not only this slide up to last year. It's just, if you look, at the bottom, in 2015, we had two new drugs with different mechanism of actions. And last year, it was three drugs. So I think this is quite unique. I don't see this for AML. I don't see it for CLL, for the chronic leukemias, and so on. So um, it's interesting. 
and it's very encouraging. And the, the good thing, I don't think this is going to stop. So we have more drugs and we have different mechanism of action. So in each column, different uh, mechanism of action and in each column we have choices. So patients, you have choices. If you don't respond well to a drug or you don't tolerate one very well, you can have another one and so on. So uh, this again is quite unique. And it also shows that we are now learning more about the biology of the disease because to attack a disease, you know to understand the disease. And I think that's a, how a reflection of how we now know about myeloma. And of course, as uh, Dr. Oriol has mentioned, with new drugs, we have new combinations. Initially, we had Velcade. Steroids were always there in combination, but then we have the immune modulators, lenalidomide, and so they were the doublet combinations, two drugs. Then now we have triplets, and I think we are going to have more. I don't know if a patient will tolerate six drugs at the same time on combination, I don't know, but there is a big choice now. So this slide is just to put you a bit in the picture. So last year we had uh, 27 new active, basically 27 new drugs authorized in Europe. And of course, eight were for cancer. Cancer is, is the leading uh, therapeutic area. And of those eight drugs, three were for myeloma. I mean, if there was an Oscar ceremony, you know, there's always a film that gets everything, best director, best actress. <laughs> if there was a, an Oscar for regulatory approval, myeloma would be the winner, <laughs> by far, by far. And in this slide, I mean, you have all the other diseases, for example, cardiovascular disease, just one drug. But there are areas that didn't get one, like psychiatry. No drug, no new drug for depression, for schizophrenia, for anything. So this is a bit of the context that I, I, I wanted to bring here. And of course, there is more to come. At the American Society of Hematology last year, they had a slide with all these new drugs in the pipeline and probably soon will come. I put these ones here, but they, they, we will have more. So there is a non-stop. This is a lot of work for regulators, I have to say. <laughs> Myeloma is in my unit. I work in the oncology unit as, as a, a regulator in the UK. And, um, and my boss says, oh, another new drug on myeloma. And the myeloma tends to come to me. And I thought, oof, <laughs> another one. So we are keeping up with, and for patients, this is the best news you could have. I don't think it would get much better. But now we regulators, we, we realized years ago we needed to change, okay? One of the changes is not only to approve a drug in a faster way, in a quicker way, it's for clinical development, it has to be a bit quicker. Um, so minimal residual disease, as Alfonso has mentioned before, is how much disease do you have after treatment? You know, that is not detectable by conventional uh, ways, by microscope, by blood tests, and so on. So this is an end point in clinical trials that will lead to faster approval. But uh, so we, we worked on a guideline on uh, MRD uh, for chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and it was published uh, last year, I think, or two years ago. So at that time, when we were working on it, we realized that it was not ready for myeloma. Because sometimes you know the concept, you know it's nearly there, but you need maybe the technology to detect it in a sort of valid way, not random way, to, to do a clinical study that you can see the results are true. So um, we left it for a little while, and then the International Myeloma Group published a guideline last August, and that's when we realized we were ready. So we published a concept paper in January, but we have already started on the guideline. So we, this is ongoing work, is by the Oncology Working Party, and we hope to finish it by 2018. So what happens is uh, we've got a draft nearly finished, um, and then because uh, when we do the draft, there's always questions. For example, when is the best time to measure minimal residual disease in a patient. So at the time of complete response 
or a month later, depends on the, on the if it's taking a monoclonal antibody, is having transplant, is not having transplant, and so on. So we have a number of questions, and we will do a workshop with experts, scientists on that field particularly. And I hope that the draft will be published uh, end of this year or early next year. And then when we publish, normally we leave around six months, so we are open for comments. And you will have an opportunity then to comment. So this is a changing because we need to be faster in getting drugs to you. That was one of the things I wanted to talk about you. And this is ongoing, and we, we will get there. And the other changing in regulation is because patients are participating more and more. And it's not about where you are or which meetings you attend. It's the mentality. We as regulators, we are now changed. I mean, I've been working in regulation since 2002, and the mentality has changed. You are now part of it. And uh, the CHMP did a pilot project over several years, and uh, the, it was published uh, two months ago in May, and, and the, the feedback of that participation was very positive. And patients now attend scientific discussions. I was uh, last month in an, uh, it's a scientific advisory group at the European Medicines Agency. And basically, when the CHMP is deciding whether to approve a drug or not, and many times the 28 member states are split, and it's very difficult, um, so the CHMP invites this advisory group, which gets external ed experts to discuss. So I was invited. It was for another uh, disease in, in acute myeloid leukemia, but it has happened in, in myeloma. And uh, there were two patients representatives there. So the patients are asked by the experts what their opinion. And that's taken on board for the final decision. Okay, we, we had a myeloma elicitation patient preference study. It was done last year. And it was done uh, the European Medicines Agency, the UK Myeloma Group, and also the University of Groningen. And it was very interesting. We invited patients to give us their views whether, how would they trade, for example, extending their survival time against very bad side effects, like very bad diarrhea and so on. And we, the regulators, thought, well, they are going to answer this. And the answers were different. So, um, and that helped us that we will need to ask you more when we decide and define clinical studies. And, and this is about the patient participation is before and after approval. It's a complete ongoing process. And, and I think that will continue. Thank you very much. Thank you. thank you, Beatriz. <coughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Beatriz, for, for that. So um, I'm going to, with, with, uh, with Jaime, um, so Beatriz has talked to us about these first steps, but well, it's not first step, but from, from basically <coughs> assessing how safe and how, what kind of efficacy is so in a drug which goes through the approval process and giving the marketing authorization. And, and then when this happens is when sometimes we are struggling with, with pricing issues and, and with having access to this treatment that has shown this efficacy and has proved to be, to be good for, for the patients. So um, it, one of the main problems that we from the patient community have observed is sometimes when, when we go to, to pricing, especially within the EU, EU member states, uh, when you are talking about HTA processes, when you are talking about pricing and reimbursement processes, <coughs> it seems that you are talking to a very different thing depending on the country you are. You are, you are. So I had the chance to go through the publication you co author for the European Commission about commonalities and differences in pricing and reimbursements across, different, uh, uh, across the different member states. And uh, I have a couple of questions for you. First of all, do you think it might be that there is a, some kind of a space for having some common processes, real common processes, so in order to grant a better access to, to, to treatment in the different health systems? And also another question, which has to be, I think, with pricing and affordability. What's from, 
sometimes you are pointed out like the bad guys because you are not the one who are, who are giving access to, to the treatment, but what is your perception? Because we have witnessing how we are having certain treatments in patients who are living longer, and sometimes you are talking about drugs which are costing thousands of euros per cycle, which sometimes systems are not able to pay with that. So I would like to, to, to have your opinion on these two questions. And, uh, and also I think you have a few yeah. slides there, so feel free to, to, to use the podium. Okay. Um, thank you also for, um, for the invitation to be here. Thank you for these two very easy questions to understand about your own harmonization process in, this, in Europe for pricing and reinvestment. I, I need to clarify that I'm not a payer, but it's okay, I have been a working like advisor for payer for a long time ago. I'm right now a professor teaching pharmacoeconomics, economic evaluation. I have been working a lot with the European Commission dealing with price and investment, WHO. So I know payer, but I know how payer are thinking about that. So I, I, I don't think that payer are the bad guys in the, this movie. I, I want to, the reason because I want to give you some um, background um, is because I think sometimes the message is not very clear. So let me clarify. The first one question is about harmonization. So we are going to have like one single price in Europe, um, one single process for price and reinvestment. The answer is very clear, no, okay? So we have European Medicine Agency that was a very good for a long time ago, but there is no the possibility right now to have a single process for pricing and reinvestment. The reason is very clear. Pricing and reinvestment is a national competence. And pricing of the medicine is paid by the government, so the government wants to decide which medicine they are going to cover. If we go, there's many publications about that, this is one of the published a few years ago, that if we go country by country, uh, we can see that there are different agencies that are approving for pricing and investment. This is not the main issue. The main, the main issue is this one. In every country, they're using different criteria for pricing and reinvestment. In some countries, they're taking into account the budget impact. In some other countries, they are not dealing with, with affordability. They are, they are dealing just with cost-effectiveness analysis. So when someone say, okay, this medicine is efficiency in UK, it's okay, just in UK. It's not in Spain, probably it's not in Germany. So. The, the issue is not that we don't have one single process. The issue is different process with different criteria. This is the most important issue. This, this is one of the reasons because there are some delay in introducing medicine in some country versus another. But there is no, the only problem is not that there is many different criteria. The problem is that even when we are making economic model, not all the countries are using the same modeling system. In some countries, they're using cost effectiveness analysis, and some other are using cost utility that you know with cost utility we have having to account at the preference of the patient. So, different criteria and different model system. So, I can say almost impossible to have one single price and reinvestment. But we have one model that many countries are trying to copy as the, the UK model. I mean, you, probably you're very familiar with NICE, where they are. Many medicines every year that decide not to cover because they are not um, providing good efficiency, and there are some other products that reinvest. Th that's okay. This is the, the issue. When some product is not reinvest, the reason is because there is another product that is more efficiency than this one. So we, we are not, I mean, the payer in this case, this is not only the Q UK case, this is the case in many countries. The reason because they are not covering this one is because they are not that it's more efficiency. This is very important to clarify. Because for orphan medicine, we are working in a different way. Here, we are dealing with what is called opportunity cost. We are covering this one because it's better than this one in terms of efficiency. Some in some cases, in the last few years, there, we, we found this kind of message in, in the journal about the high cost medicine. What health economists try to explain every time is what we call opportunity cost. This is a very old picture published in British Medical Journal a long time ago try to clarify that if we spend a lot of money in cancer, in cancer, we don't have money for hepatitis C. If we spend a lot of money, if we spend a lot of money in cardiovascular disease, we don't have money for another. So it's opportunity cost. This, this is the way to explain how we have to select it any time the most efficient uh, treatment. Of course, we have a very strong consequence for patients. Uh, this is a very old publication, 2007, published in Anna of Oncology. They don't publish anymore. This very um, agile, agile picture, 
we can say that there are many countries in Europe. We are not speaking about Tanzania or Uganda. We are speaking about Cyprus, where they have only six medicines for oncology. Um, this is the case of Cyprus. Again, this is not um, a developing country. Uh, we will go, for example, to Poland. Uh, the issue is no, uh, let me look up for Poland. This will be here. Poland is not the issue about the access to medicine. It's the delay in introducing the medicine in the market. It's 2,190 days, almost seven years. And here, we are discussing about Euro. So different process, different result. For Chua, we need to do, to do something. But the most important driver of having this delay is the price of the medicine. So the question that we have been discussing all the time is why price of medicine are so high in some cases. Um, I must say, I don't have the right answer. You know, there are m many articles that say that there is no rational behind pricing of medicine. There is no rational behind that. Let me, let me make very clear. But I have some ideas. I have some clues about that. The first one is this one. This is an official WHO, WTO document to some form, explaining how pricing is setting around the world. Do you understand? Probably not. Probably not. So the price of the medicine is setting what is called international reference pricing. So we set the price here very high. Let's go to this way. Let's go to the way. Let's take the average of this one. So this is. So how is setting the price? So we go to the journal. We make some marketing and say that the patatis is called 94,000 euros. And then we go around the world with this price. I must say that this is very stupid, but this is how in many countries around the world, the price of the medicine is setting using international reference pricing. But then if we go in practice and we are looking, for, I, I got this publication for um, Meloma. In many cases for the new medicine that are in the market, we got discount about 75%. So we are comparing price that artificial price that are not real price. Of course, they have a very strong consequence. In many countries, they decide not to reinvest the product because it's very expensive, unless you give a very, very strong discount. We have also very, very interesting uh, example that you know better than me. A, f a long time ago, 2007, in the UK, now decide not to reinvest Belkate. They, they say that Belkate is not efficiency product. I decide to introduce what is called outcome-based agreement. They, say to, they decide to cover for all the patient, and the manufacturer give the money back for all the patient that did not get responded to the treatment. It was easier to just to give a discount, but if you give a discount, you know, international reference pricing, or if you make a price cap, international reference pricing have a very strong effect in all the countries of the world. So in this case, you prefer just to give some money back because this kind of money back is confidential. So still, you have a very high price in the UK, but in practice, UK is paying, is pay, paying just half of the price of the medicine. The issue is, what is the relationship between pricing and outcome? Because sometimes we are missing this very close relationship. Let me go. I didn't find anything about myeloma, but I found this example about uh, colorectal cancer. Colorectal cancer, during the last few years, we got in efficacy of effectiveness, we got the double. A long time ago, it was 54 weeks, we got the double, 140 weeks. That is very good. Overall survival, we double overall survival. That is perfect. How much, how much did, you, did we pay for that? We went from $100 to $180,000 euros. Dollars. So we are paying around 80,000 times more for getting double outcome. This is what payers are really worried about that. They are not worried about this. They are worried about the future. And the future is like this. I don't want to show more data, but they are coming to the some treatment to the market that cost 500,000, even more. There are some new treatment coming to the market that cost 1 million euros per patient per year for the rest of the life. So pay are really worried about that. Because sometimes I think that we are a little bit confused. We are a little bit confused because we are thinking that high cost means high value. 
I, I want to highlight this, uh, you know, statement by Warren Buffett about price of what we pay and value what you, what you get. In this case, and this is, will be my last slide, I, I'm sorry because it's the Spanish, but probably you can understand very well, this is what Germany is doing right now. The medicines in the market, after two years, you can, with the new data, I'm going to reduce the price according to the therapeutic value that you're providing. So if the product don't provide the therapeutic value, you have to review the price. If you don't review the price, you are no longer in the market. So I'm going to give you the opportunity to stay in the market. I'm going to believe your efficacy data, but after two years, you have to come back with, the, with effectiveness data, and we are going to review the price according to your value. So what we are going to do is what is called value-based pricing. We are going to pay according to the value. I think that we, we missed that during the last few years. In many cases, we are paying so much. Thank you. <laughs> also, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Jaime. And, and last but not least, uh, Susanna, I would like to ask you for, I mean, you, you have worked in the industry for many years. I know now, now that you are happily retired <laughs> for one year and so on. And you have been working with, in, in different sides of the industry, not only with patient advocates, also in some other areas for a long time. But you really have been in both sides and sometimes advocating for patients within the, the, the industry. And you have been witnessing, witnessing how patient preferences and so on are more and more taken into account. Even sometimes we, we think it is not, not enough, but we are, we are reaching that point. So um, from, your side, from, from, from your experience, we're always demanding to be early involved in, in, the, in the drug development process, helping to, to to set the research priorities, to include the special preferences. So from your side, how, how do you think industry is adapting to this new, this new, I wouldn't call it patient centricity because I hate that term, but you know, to really involve the patient view into these whole processes. And also another question that I would like to, to ask you, uh, now that the pricing issue has arisen to the, into, into the, into the panel, is what, we're not trying to point anyone here, but do you think that uh, in the particular space of myeloma, every time we see a new drug coming to the market, it, it certainly happens with Hadme has explained. The outcomes are good, but the price is increasing exponentially. So do you think from, from, your, from your perspective from this industry, there is some kind of possibility from your point of view to really improve this and Basically, or what are the solutions that the industry might be proposing to, to improve access to these new, new drugs across the different countries? Thank you, Alfonso, and thank you, MP, to invite me. Uh, first of all, I will disclose that uh, uh, my point of view will be personal based on uh, <laughs> years of experience in, 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 in the industry. So I feel free to be a little bit provocative sometimes, also versus the industry. Um, Patient involvement, I, I started to be involved on that. So for the one who, who do not know me, I was working uh, uh, in the industry for 40 years, but in the last uh, 12 years, I was working in Novartis Oncology in a relation with patient groups uh, in uh, uh, cancer and in the last years in hematology. So I know MP very well and I even, uh, Anita can recall. Uh, so all uh, the uh, development of the myeloma advocacy in Europe. Okay, so patient involvement and importance to, to have uh, the patient view and the patient voice uh, in the industry is, uh, is becoming uh, important, is becoming well known, uh, is becoming uh, something that companies are now looking actively uh, personally, I started almost four years ago. Uh, at that time, the head of Novartis Oncology Region Europe was really advocating to have protocols that represent uh, also the view of a uh, patient. His, uh, his utopia was to have a protocol saying, okay, this, this protocol was 
approved or developed with patients. So we, we started a lot of uh, different, uh, different uh, uh, try to have, uh, to have uh, this voice. And, uh, and also I remember uh, we involved MPE, and I think Alfonso, you were one together with a colleague from Myeloma UK to, to comment on uh, a phase two protocol that we, we, we submitted to you. And uh, I was very happy because I, I, uh, they, they were very fast in replying because, again, companies are elephants <laughs> and to convince them of the value. And the, the, the second thing, they are, they are always thinking about money. So you have to show the value also of involving patient in clinical trial as early as possible. So, to, and, and now what is happening, there are uh, really uh, efforts also thanks to Eopati that I hope you know that this is a, a very, very uh, helpful uh, project of uh, the European Commission and IMI to uh, educate patients. But there was a lot of work, parallel work on how to involve a patient. And there are documents that I, I hope you know about uh, uh, patient involvement with regulatory, patient involvement with industry, patient involvement with um, mm, with ethic committees. Uh, but be, being back to industry, we have to show value. And my advocacy point was, what if not? And I have a case from Novartis, it's not on myeloma, but I have a, a clear case. We had a uh, drug uh, approved in Europe two years later uh, in the forecast because Nobody, nobody listened to one comment that I collected from patient uh, advocates about one, one exclusion criteria. They said, listen, if you maintain that, and it was about number of drugs taken in, in the control, if you take that, it will be a long, a long time because we have few patients taking it. So, and I was saying, okay, my dear colleagues in Novartis, how much it costed these two years of delay because you didn't listen. So, and I think it's starting, but we have, again, to show to the community uh, the value. And um, I hope you know that I was a happy co-author of, of, of a paper that was done by two patient advocates, Jan Geisler and Bettina Ril, two industry representatives, myself, and at that time, I'm just representing Mary Hulenop, who you know, and we, we produced a roadmap of how to involve a patient in the industry. And I remember when we, we proposed the first, the, 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 the comment to this roadmap was, but what was the methodology? It was not a methodology, it was collecting opinion in different uh, uh, advisory boards, like your party meetings and so on, of how to do. And how to do is from the beginning at the end and after. As, as also she showed before and after. Access, pricing, I'm not an expert, but uh, I can tell you what I saw in Novartis. I saw an evolution of a department uh, uh, that is called market access uh, that from one person become a, a really a department of five or six person trying to understand that, that the complex situation of Europe. I was working in Novartis Oncology Europe and he showed the complexity. And also we know the complexity of, uh, of economics in these in this, in this countries uh, of affordability. Um, again, we are there to make money. We, they, <laughs> we are there to make money because if you don't have enough to invest, innovation will not come. It's clear that public research is not able to bring such innovations that private companies are working. But on the other hand, the conscious companies are really trying to find a way. And they are adapting, as, as again, he showed their models to what is possible. And for example, these, uh, these uh, uh, payback, if uh, the drug is not, is not uh, uh, working, clearly there is a negotiation about how to define this drug is working in myeloma or in breast cancer, or is becoming also, for example, in my country, I'm, I'm coming from Italy, is becoming one of the way. 
But I can, I can say again, there are a lot of efforts in companies, I think what I saw in Novartis, to see how to. And in, 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 uh, in myeloma, we had a drug to add on. And I remember the discussion we had, okay, but I think it, it was adding to, to Velcade. The, 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 but I think Velcade is now out of patent. Uh, oh, no, or, or it's become, so there was a drug that was uh, in association with, uh, with the Novartis drug that was becoming out of patent. In any case, he's speaking about also the future, understanding if a generic will be available so the cost will be more affordable. Uh, also, I, I remember we were speaking about, okay, but this is not a chronic, these are cycles. So, and, and show the value for the patient. But on the other hand, there were a lot of, uh, um, of side effects and we had a, 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 an advisory board to understand how to, to explain to the patient how to manage these side effects. Because uh, again, uh, uh, diarrhea, I remember the comments from doctors, from patients and doctors, uh, the, 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 the diarrhea for patients can be much, much more worse than, than what doctors. is descri described by doctors. So I think that the conscious companies are, are working a lot to, they understand, they have a business, but they understand they have to, to cope with the situation and therefore the bill. Okay, thank you, Susanna. So uh, now, um, I mean, I would like to open the discussion for you. So if any one of you would like to make a question or to add something to the debate right now. It's okay, so Viorica. Thank you very much to all of you. I have two questions. One is for Professor, Professor, um, I'm sorry, Espin. Uh, thank you for your very inspiring presentation, sir. Uh, you were talking about criteria for assessment are different for each individual country. Uh, who sets these criteria? Are they set at the national level? Is the, is the pharmaceutical com uh, the company is setting the criteria? And the most important thing, why criteria cannot be the same for at least all EU countries? Because theoretically, they should not be differences. Uh, unless, of course, they depend entirely on the economic status of each individual country. And then, if that's the case, then it should be, it should come under the purview of the Economic Commission of the EU, which, unlike the Health Commission, you know, uh, as far as I know, uh, um, sometimes controls from the EU headquarters uh, this issue. The second question is uh, addressed to uh, um, uh, Dr. Oriol. Um, I take pride uh, in saying that uh, Myeloma Euronet Romania, an organization which I represent, after 10 years of lobbying, could finally succeed in including the thalidomide in the oncological program. Yet, very few people can benefit from this therapeutical, you know, because, uh, because uh, of the restriction imposed by the protocol of EMEA, uh, whereby treatment with thalidomide is indicated only for the first phase patients. In other words, the patients with a refractory relapse, my husband had a refractory, you know, for example, they cannot be administered this medication. And now is the question for you. Uh, what do you think and what is your opinion uh, regarding the inconsistencies between the protocol of EMA the ESMO guidelines, which are not quite very clear when it comes to the therapeutical use of thalidomide, and not in the least important, uh, not in the least, the, the, the fact that in both Australia and in the United States, there is not such prohibition. Uh, I found out recently uh, in, a, in a meeting with IMF that in both these big countries, big continents almost, thalidomide is used for refractory and for the people with relapsed. Sometimes it's a question of life and death for some of them, considering particularly that in Romania and many other countries, thalidomide and Velcade are the only 
the only medication you can use because we don't have access to Nilo, Ixa, Daru, Tumabib, and many others novel treatment. Thank you very much. You're, you're the first. Yes. <laughs> thank, thank you. Um, I think that you made two questions and one comment. The question is, why, um, who decides the criteria? The criteria is setting for every country. Remember that every country decide, um, have, is the budget holder, so every country decides the criteria according to introduce. I, I don't want to show you more data, but if we see how many medicines are reinvested in Spain, I can say around 10,000 products in Spain are reinvested. If you go to Belgium, I think it's around 5,000 5, products. So with the budget that every country have, decide which are the criteria in order to reinvest the product. So different budget, different criteria for reinvestment. It's a national country, yes. Why are different? If we go back to see the criteria, you can see that some of the country decide that one of the criteria is uh, R&D, for example, or public uh, or, or, um, budget impact analysis. If you're a country like UK or Germany, um, you have a lot of company in the country, probably you want to give one criteria for to having R&D in the country. So you decide that one of the criteria is R&D. So you decide the criteria, and it could be not possible to have the same criteria because every country in Europe is totally different. So probably even with the same criteria, probably the result could be totally different. Because if we set the same criteria R&D, there are countries that have R&D, probably the product will be reinvested, but the country that have no R&D, the product will be no reinvest. So even with the same criteria, the result will be different. Um, your final statement was related to European Commission. I told you before, pricing and reinvestment of the medicine, there's a very old 1989 directive of pricing of medicine. It's a national competence. So what they are doing right now, European Commission is just checking that the countries are put in place the European legislation. That's all. They cannot do anything more. Of course, in the last European Union presidency, there was Malta. European Commission was requesting to the countries more collaboration. So right now, for example, uh, we published a few weeks ago a paper about joint procurement. So what, what about small countries go together in order, let's go to see Malta, Cyprus, Latvia, to, to, to go together and make a tender together in order to uh, take advantage of economy at the scale, uh, as economy call. Could be, in some product can be, but not for all the product. But when we are speaking about rare diseases, um, in country there are two or three patients, probably you go together, um, sit down with the pharma company to say, okay, we are not only Malta, we are Malta, Cyprus, Latvia, and so on. Probably the final result will be better than that if you go along. Well, there, there are several problems here together. Let me see how, we, how, how I can answer to you adequately. Um, the, the term, the, when you register a product based on a, on a pivotal trial, in terms of safety, it's a good idea to approve it in the same conditions that you made the trial. That has advantages and disadvantages. The main advantage is safety for the patients mainly. And you know, if you have a trial in second line with a certain product for myeloma, you get the approval of the EMA or the FDA for the second line, not for the third, not for the fifth, not for the first. That's, uh, that gives you the, the, the knowledge that you are approving the, the, that product in the situation in which it was proved effective and not in other situations in which you don't know about, about effectiveness. That's good on principle. Then there are some problems that come up. The main problems are that sometimes the, the trial was restrictive, so you are, you are restricting that to a group of patients, and you probably assume that it could be effective also in other groups of patients, but you are assuming that. So I think it's a good idea to approve a drug in the conditions it was tried, at least for a certain time. Afterwards, it happens that you are using the drug in several other situations, and then it's very important to uh, collect all this information because you could expand the drug. For example, I agree with you that nowadays it is not logical to have thalidomide approved only in one line of therapy. As in each day, it was not normal to have, for example, Belcade approved in the older patient first line, in the younger patient second line, but not in the younger patient first line. 
but there was not a trial proving that it was effective in that situation. So I think that the balance could be you have to approve the drug in the situation in which it was, it was tried, but after 10 years, 12 years experience, if you gather enough experience that you can combine, you can give bortezomib with dexamethasone or with doxorubicin or with lenalidomide or clalidomide, you could have a more general appro approval like Belkate is approved in myeloma and give it however your, your knowledge of the drug um, allows you to do that. To do. That, that, that would be a good idea. Then there's another problem also with that sort of approval that companies are not always interested in all the drugs they have. So if you have a very good drug but you are not particularly interested in have it, uh, having it approved for a certain indication, you will never have it. For example, rituximab for lymphoma has been used uh, for, it could, it could be used in all B cell lymphomas. But, of course, trials were made in, in the more prevalent lymphomas, diffuse large uh, B-cell lymphoma, follicular lymphoma. Who cares to make a trial to prove that rituximab is also in, important, for example, in Burkitt lymphoma? Nobody will make that trial. Why? You have the drug in the market, you have the drug in the market for 80% of the potential patients. Who cares of doing a trial for the other 20? And that's another problem of all the regulatory uh, marketing. So, so uh, there's several points where all the safety that you have uh, in terms of MA approval on this is, is failing, mainly in small populations uh, when the drug has several years and it's, you are, doctors are very experienced with it, could you expand the indication and make it more broad? That, that would make sense. But in any case, for example, talking about the case of Romania, of course, uh, even if thalidomide is only approved first line, if you don't have an alternative for the second line, it should be authorized also in the second line and the third line because you know, don't have an alternative. Another thing would be if, you, okay, you have thalidomide for the first line, but you have lenalidomide approved for the second line. Then, but if you, if you don't have the, the second choice, but that happens now in Spain, for example, with carfilzomib. You have lenalidomide, carfilzomib, dexamethasone approved the second line, but patients that where before that approval are having lenalidomide and dexamethasone second line. But they cannot have carfilzomib and dexamethasone the third line because carfilzomib and dexamethasone is not approved yet. So there's always inconsistencies in all these approvals because, of course, if a new patient can have len carfilzomib dex and an old patient relapses after len dex, why is not he able to have carfilzomib then? Because there's no an approval. So there are some inconsistencies that should be treated apart and have special conditions for situations like this, of course. Yeah, but if it's a situation with lenalidomide, I would be getting the least ratio. Yeah, of course. No, I, I understood that, yeah. <laughs> so I have another question more uh, also to uh, Dr. Orion. Um, at the AI, we had a discussion with uh, one of the doctors, was Dr. Mateos. Uh, about, um, yeah, she pleads that um, already in the stage of uh, smoldering myeloma, you should uh, treat patients. Uh, that's a bit of a taboo, I think, uh, for some clinicians, because uh, why should you treat uh, patients who have, at that moment, no complaints? But we look at the high risk, of course. But you, um, uh, you treat then the, the results, although they don't have complaints. Uh, how do you look at that uh, development? Would it uh, be the future for myeloma that, uh, that it wouldn't be a taboo to um, treat patients who have no complaints, but we see it in the results to get them at that stage at the minimal res uh, res residue? Well, well so so sometimes you have to break with, tradi with tradition, you know? <laughs> that, that's progress. I mean, Initial trials with the smoldering myeloma were, were very negative, but it was logical. You were treating patients with smoldering myeloma in general. That means that you were treating patients that at least a third of them would never have required treatment, and that's wrong. And you were treating patients with very ineffective drugs, so and very toxic drugs. So it obviously was that was the reason, the main reason why a, a, a patient with smoldering multiple myeloma should not be treated for 50 years. No? But now you have two situations which are 
clearly different. The first is how do you identify high-risk patients, those patients that in three, four months' time will have symptoms. So this is an asymptomatic patient, but, but is an asymptomatic patient that is asymptomatic by chance, because in four months he will have symptoms. And you can identify this patient, that's one thing. And the other thing is that you have more effective drugs. If I think that at the point, let's imagine some years from now, <laughs> uh, at the point where you have effective drugs able to cure myeloma and not so toxic, or even if they are a little bit toxic, but they can cure myeloma, the, the point of not treating asymptomatic patients will lose its, its sense completely because if you, if you can have a treatment that can cure you, you don't have to wait for symptoms. You don't do that in breast cancer, you don't do that in colon cancer. Even if you have a small polyp, they take it out. <laughs> and you have, if there's something left, you have chemotherapy. So the future is going towards treating more patients. But to do that, you have to go slowly because you need effective drugs and safe drugs. And that's important. And we are starting to have that. That's why the question of small multiple myeloma arises now and has not arisen 10 years before. Yeah, thank you for the dialogue. Uh, it's very good to have a dialogue to be more provocative and to have all the stakeholders. Uh, my question is a kind of a general one, uh, which goes to each uh, dialogue participant. Uh, it's a little bit provocative, but uh, as I'm very ha happy, by the way, to hear that Oscar goes to, to myeloma, because three out of, I think, eight uh, regulatory is for myeloma. But when you look at the overall uh, future of myeloma treatment, uh, Oscar is a sort of festival of hundreds of firms, and the budget, uh, and the, pay, the payers and the patients only have uh, money to buy two tickets, meaning that the budget is limited. So how would you see, I mean, it's good that we have excellent drugs, yet the efficacy, safety, uh, and the value of the drug needs long years to, to evaluate. But still, how would you see uh, in terms of budgeting uh, and the new drugs? Thanks. So anyone in the panel wants to, to answer yeah. that? Yeah. I, I, I can make some comments. I mean, from the point of view of payer, they are very happy because more products in the market in many cases mean that you increase the competition in the market, and you know that the competition in the market is better because the price goes down. That this is okay. The issue is that you know that when the product came to the market, came with a, with a patent, um, uh, during this patent period of time, there is not really a competition. So the product can be set in at a higher price. In, in many countries, we can see that even the product is not launched because uh, due to the it's international referent pricing and due to parallel trade, if you launch the product very, with a very low price in Poland, many countries are going to make parallel trade and the product will be no any longer in the market. So from one side, it's very happy because many products will be in the market. I, I, you, you see also that payer want to people get cured, but at the same time, they are very worried because there is no rational behind the price. So, you know, from one side, good news, and the other side, bad news. Um, in, in other cases, what is, what is important is to give very clear message to pharma companies. Say, okay, if you are providing new therapeutic value, I'm going to approve high price. But the new high price will be related to the therapeutic value. It cannot, if you are providing, let me say, 20% extra um, outcome, in overall survival or whatever that you're using, I'm not going to give you 100% extra price. And right now, my experience with Peje, they are not giving this clear message. Um, and this could be more clear according with the criteria. And for sure, we are dealing here with content with high income, another content with lower income compared with the first one. And some issues should be related to what happened in practice. Um, I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but probably one of the issues to resolve that is to avoid parallel trade. So if we avoid using parallel trade, the country that's setting the price will be the price only for that country. 
So you have no sense to sell to another country. So one of the solution is the, the price for Malta, it will be the price for Malta, and the price for Poland will be the price for, and it will be some kind of differential pricing. So higher price for country with higher GDP per capita, and lower price for um, country with lower GDP per capita. If you avoid parallel trade, the price will be only for that country. Could be one of the solutions. It's not, it's, not, it's not easy, but could be one of them. I think uh, the faster access will come with uh, faster development. And I think one of the things we hope regulators will help for that and eventually will help to drop the prices will be to have different endpoints for clinical trials. And we had a conference in London this week, in fact, on Monday, and it was on oncology, not just myeloma. And uh, there were uh, scientists, the um, HTA bodies were invited, people from NICE, um, academia, industry, and so on. And, and, and now, now the challenge is which endpoints to use. So industry uh, takes less time in getting an approval for a drug in development, we approve it quicker. So instead of waiting, for example, for median overall survival for three years follow up in a patient, you may have in seven months the endpoint or in a year. So it's just, I mean, it's, it's a, a, a big reduction of the clinical development. So that will be a faster access, I think. And hopefully, uh, because the investment should be less, it should be, it should be, in theory, reflected in the price. The other thing is that for a long time, the European Medicines Agency has been looking into that as well. And when they designed the adaptive pathways, one of the things they brought also in the dialogue early on was the HDA bodies. And in the UK, we had a similar scheme. It's called the Early Access Medicine Scheme. So for drugs that have very promising results and are early on, um, we put them in the market in the UK only, but uh, the company, the industry, have to provide it free until it gets the full development and the full approval. So we regulators have been already going on how to get all this faster access. Uh, but I, I think it will be the quicker development with new endpoints uh, that will make a difference. But we will have to wait a bit. Uh, but I, I think that's, that's the next change. So, so my point of view, I, I agree that we have, that we have all to, to agree on the value of what is available. And uh, I remember at a UPATI course, uh, there was a discussion about a, a, a drug on, on pancreatic cancer that was evaluated by the HTA French body. And uh, it was significant, but uh, the, the, I think it was one month more, something like that. And I remember we discussed it with the patient advocate and say, okay, but so the value, so from, from you, patient, uh, also, you have to advocate, and this is what I, I also told uh, in, in Novartis, if we have a, a good drug, the patient groups will work with us to show that there is a need, but we have to show the value. If you have a drug that is not really giving value to the, to the society, to the patient, uh, don't, don't waste money. The value is, is, is what we, we need to all to a degree, where it is. And the value is also to find the good and point to use. And this overall survival for some cancer drug is killing uh, the, 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 the process because it's too long to show overall survival. So we have to, to find, uh, to agree all together, patient, the regulators, and industry, what are the good and point to use to... to I'm not an economist, I'm a clinician, and I'm very bad on economy, so uh, I've always thought that uh, if uh, prices were lower, access would be more granted, and there wouldn't be so much restrictions, and probably companies would make more money, but uh, when I say that, economists don't really believe me, so <laughs> may I, may, I, may be, I may be wrong. <laughs> so I live in a country where you have restrictions for all expensive drugs, you don't have restrictions for cheap drugs, so I think 
probably they should make the drug, drug cheap <laughs> and make more money, but they, they make their sums and probably the, they've done some up. Adding to what she said about value, I, I think that the situation now in myeloma is very transitional because in the long run you see that uh, uh, drugs that are really expensive for the payer are drugs that you are having in the long run, drugs that you're having forever, for example. If we go towards a curative treatment, that curative will be value for sure, and it won't be expensive whatever the prices of the drugs are. And many companies are working in that line also because they are thinking about combinations of four or five drugs, but when they think about that, they don't think about four or five drugs forever, which is unsustainable by all means. It means that four or five drugs may allow you to cure, and you cure, you don't have to have uh, long-term treatment, and then there's value there because you're substituting, uh, you're, you need a big budget for a, a very short uh, course of time, which is very different than have a lower budget for forever. So, so cu curation of myeloma is really the value where we have to look forward right now. Are there any questions? Oh, yeah, please. Uh, the question is for Dr. Oriol. Um, I'm representing the Israel amyloidosis group, but the question is the same. You talked about mixing drugs for uh, uh, treatment of myeloma. It's the same for amyloidosis. I understand very good the procedure of developing a new drug, which has a clinical, clinical phase one, two, three, and so on and then it goes to the FDA or uh, whatever to get the improvement. Uh, I would like you to uh, explain how you start to use uh, different mixes of uh, drugs. I mean, it's not done by a pharma company, it's done by doctors. So it's a trial and error uh, way of deciding or what is the procedure to prove this mix of drugs also? Well, amyloidosis is one of the typical cases where approvals uh, are just going far, uh, backward because there's uh, less patients. Normally, to prove that one combination of drugs is superior to another, you need a, a big number, or either a big difference, or either a big number of patients. And you don't have a big number of patients with amyloidosis. Tell me about the myeloma. <laughs> to say, and perhaps you, you can, you can uh, uh, support me, that especially if, if the disease is rare, there are ways even to propose, even for company, to propose uh, a, a drug based on uh, very few uh, court of patient, even in, a, in an open phase, if there are, is a rare disease where even there are no drugs, and then you, you use adaptive pathway to go on and you you work with EMA to have uh, uh, trials. Uh, again, in Novartis, we had a, a drug that was approved in, in, uh, in, uh, in a very rare disease uh, with 26 patients from a, a, a center in the US. Uh, so a, a, let's say an investigator initiated trial who showed the value. And then you work with the regulators to continue to show uh, then we had uh, we had a, a, a first approval asking asking Novartis to do first a trial. So there is a way, especially for for rare diseases. You can, yes. yes, I mean the, for the combinations, uh, there are trials done uh, over the years that show that that combination works uh, better than a monotherapy or if you have three drugs, better than two drugs, and that the safety, the risk, and the safety is, is manageable. So normally this is based on data evidence that is produced by industry, really. Um, that's how they are approved. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, that's, that's how it's done. Is there is data provided to us regulators that that combination works. That's why they are approved as combinations. But whoever decides the combination of the drugs, it's yeah, not, I, I, my uh, opinion, it's not the doctors. I mean, no. I mean uh, no. every one of the drugs is done by another pharma, uh, pharma yes. company. So actually they're sitting together and decided to try three drugs together? Yeah, I mean, normally when you get the combinations in clinical trials, you have had previously 
other data like non-clinical data in animal models. That uh, is very often when industry gets approval in one drug, they will study also the same drug with other combinations and they try it first in non-clinical models and then if they see a synergy, they move on the development. So there is uh, previous evidence, but it's industry. But it's happening that. that companies are working in some, in some yeah. cancer, they are now studying together combination. It's yeah. happening. It's a long process again. But it's yeah. And the more drugs with different mechanisms of actions that are there, there are more combinations coming because then people study if together are better. Uh, what she said, you need a preliminary da data that give you uh, that give you uh, the confidence that that combination will be better than the two drugs uh, by by their own. So that's normally animal models or cellular cultures or whatever. I think we still have time for one more more question. So. Uh Uh, I would come back again to uh, uh, drugs and prices, but at that time, not for high prices, but for low prices. Uh, we have the problem, for example, for uh, uh, myeloma patients, that uh, from time to time, uh, we can't get melphalan. It's a very cheap drug, and, and, and there's only, uh, in the meanwhile, one company uh, which is producing it. And uh, uh, in Germany, for example, we had uh, twice the problem that uh, melphalan was not available and, uh, and patients couldn't be transplanted. So uh, what can be done on this problem too? Mm. Is there someone yeah. from Aspen in the room? <laughs> I think that um, I'm not very clear because I worked on that a long time ago. There is a very clear legislation that if you have market authorization in the country, you have the obligation to supply. If you don't supply, I mean, because I, I know that when there are some problems of supply, it should be in the Spanish medicine agency, there is one session that says, okay, this problem has problem supply. So you need to justify why not. I know that in some countries where the price have been set very low, the manufacturer can go to the, to the Minister of Health and say, okay, look at here, the price is so that low that even we don't cover the marginal cost. So please increase the price. And we have several examples in Spain with the price where the product was lower than two euros and the government decided to, to increase the price. But as summary, there is a mandatory obligation for pharma companies, and probably you can complete that information, if you have the market authorization. Okay. If you don't have the market authorization in the country, you don't have this obligation to supply. So in many countries, the manufacturer did not apply for pricing or investment, so you don't have any obligation. As soon as you have market authorization and you apply for pricing and reinvestment, you have the obligation to supply. If you have a stock out, you have to notific make notification about that. So you, in the case of Germany, please read the legislation about how it's working. Um, the, and the best is the Minister of Health contact with the pharma companies in order to know, to know what happened. Because in some cases, it's just a stock, a short, a stock out for a short ter, ter period of time. In some other cases, it could be a different issue. So. That uh, there's been uh, pro problems with the melphalan supply in several European countries this year. And I recall three years ago the same happening with dexamethasone. Yeah. So, so, so these things. Uh, I suppose that in the long run, it's important to have at least a couple of suppliers in each country, so you can ha you can you can do for shortages. That's that's in, that's important. That's what that's what been happening with melphalan since the last shortages. Uh, every country has at least two or three suppliers. Because uh, I need, I know that I mean, needs to leave. I don't know if there is, you, you, you need to leave, and also Albert, you're not very talented. Do can we? So. How much time do you have? <laughs> when do you need to leave? I need to make a fight. <laughs> That's why. Okay. <laughs> okay, so. I'll come in afterwards if you want to. I mean, it's important, I think, because the melphalan issue. Okay. We've tackled that, Lisa. 
And, and the problem was not, you know, low prices or anything. It was a bit related to something similar to blackmail that Aspen was doing to certain governments because they wanted to increase the price. So we had no proof of that, but the commission is already investigating this and probably yeah. we will. Yeah. Yeah. There, there are several cases in the, in the US. Remember the Hillary Clinton make a very famous tweet because one price go from 20 euros to 300 euros and she says it's not going to happen anymore if, if I win the election. Um, we know that happened also in Europe. One company um, win, um, um, one company increased the price without any rationale behind that. So in this case, European Commission can play a role in order to look for the competition, yeah. Yeah, always related to money. It, it really seems that we have run out of time. I'm pretty sure that we could be talking here because yeah. I think it's very, <laughs> it has been a very interesting panel. And I would like to thank you again, Albert, Sofia, Susanna, Beatriz, and Jaime, because this is an historic day. This is the first time that we are organizing a multi-stakeholder panel. So hopefully it's not the last one. And, uh, and so thank you very much for, for being here today. And we're looking forward to meet you again. And for all of you, we're going to have a 15 minute break. So we will be coming back at quarter past five, okay? So thank you, thank you very much.